imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal with your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and cover power. The thing is, though... If you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with sharp and nails. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's the real world, I choose to go my life to. That's okay. It means something, it means something. My take on the way for what's yours. Protonic Reversal! That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed it is. It is a science thing. It is a science place. It is a scientific fact that we are all up in your face. It is time once again uh, for the one, uh, the only Protonic Reversal. Uh, welcome to it. Special guest for you today. They're all special, but special, special guest for you is uh, none other then an uh, old friend of mine and very, very, very talented young man, uh, Mr. Alex Newport. Alex, uh, welcome to the show, man. Very good to see you. That's, we, we, uh, it's, it's been a while, dude. <laughs> I was, I was thinking been, about it. Yeah, It's been way too long. Yeah, I was thinking about it today. Uh, way too long. So it's really good to see you. Um, where are you based at, at the moment? Uh, moved from Oakland to Milwaukee, Wisconsin a couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah. Just because I I wanted to you know be around more pandemic deniers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yep, absolutely. There's much more to Milwaukee than that. I'm being, it's a it's a wonderful place. It's lovely. It's 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 a lovely place. You it are, is it is it is a beautiful place. Uh, you are of course uh, you're based out of Los Angeles and have been for a while, right? Yeah, for about four years now. Well, I mean, like basically more than 20 years on and off, you know, but like I moved to, um, I moved to New York for a little bit and, uh, and obviously the Bay area, but, um, there's something about LA. I don't know. Um, it's a very good place for music is, uh, right. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. If if I wasn't doing music, I'm not totally convinced that I would be here, but, um, it's always been good to me. I've always had a lot of really good friends here and always had a, a good time in, in LA. So I, you know, I, I hate LA, but LA loves me. <laughs> well, and that's what it's all about. And, and, uh, you, you, you've kept busy. You've definitely, uh, provided a nice little niche for yourself. It seems. And it's something where you, sometimes you got to go to the mountain, you know, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that's that's all that comes down to it. And as- I've, got, I've grown to I've grown to appreciate LA very much because you know, like I lived in LA before, and then I moved to New York, and I was like, I am never coming back. Like that's it. I'm never ever going back to LA. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, New York was amazing. It's an incredible city. It's fantastic. I had a great time. But it is very difficult place to be, and especially if you're doing music, it's very difficult. And, you know, being in New York, I was able to look back at L.A. and uh, I could suddenly see the appeal of of being in L.A., you know. Sure. My wife and I had a fantastic, you know, pre-war apartment in Queens. It was beautiful. But, you know, doing your groceries and, you know, coming like traipsing through the snow up six flights of stairs, no elevator. You know, and being at being at the shops and being like, well, it's either cat litter or or, the, or water, but we can't possibly carry both. You know, so like as you get to a certain age, those kind of things become a bit more uh, a bit more of a concern, maybe. You know. Well, yeah, and it's it's something where when you're when you're paying for living in a place in that sort of manner, it really kind of makes you question what's important to you, and yeah. you know what whether especially if you don't even have the time necessarily to, you know, take place in a, Oh, well, you know, there's so many Broadway shows and it's like, I never go to those. Why would <laughs> like, I don't care. I don't, that's, that's fine. You know, that's, it's yeah, cool. Exactly. I'm glad it's there. <laughs> that was an issue. Everybody, you know, everybody in New York is like, let's hang out. Like, okay, when next week? No, I'm doing like three different jobs 
and yeah. trying to fit in a band rehearsal. Like, there's no, so it's like I never hung out with anybody there. It's way too difficult. It's just, it's, just, just it's hustling, not that yeah. in LA, but slightly slightly better in LA. Uh, so and and I guess we should we should we should talk with the fact that you know, I know you through a, a very underrated band in your personal pantheon, which is the Incredible Theory of Ruin, which I think was is a band that uh, never quite got its due. Uh, but uh, chess uh, on drums, uh, really just remarkable band. And I was very- oh, I love those guys so much. They were, both of them were amazing. Yeah, and it's it's that's it's always nice. I got kind of I got one in a, a back pocket there that when somebody says like, oh yeah, you know Alex Newport from you know, Fudge Channel and Nail Bomb, I'm like, oh, have you ever heard Theory of Ruin? And they're like, what? No. And then I get to kind of pull that one out, and they're like, oh, this is fantastic. And it's like, yeah, I, I know that's why I'm. Yeah, dude, for I it. don't know if it was if it was you know well, it was definitely the wrong time. So either it was like way too late to be doing that kind of thing, or way too early, or who knows. But it wasn't it wasn't probably the right time. But uh, but what happened? Yeah, and I, th- I think you're onto something there because I think it was like a little bit too late for like sort of the '90s noise rock world, and a little bit too early for this kind of noise rock revival that's that's happening in in the way that everything can happen at once and be kind of a niche interest now. Everything yeah. you know, everything is mini golf now. Uh, <laughs> it's like it has a dedicated fandom to it, but it doesn't have the the far wide reach that that it had right yeah for sure and, and i guess having the benefit of you know a, a pretty long career of not just uh, recording music but playing music as well i mean very very like different spot than uh, when you started up with with fudge shuttle like i mean that because that's i mean different world entirely a fudge shuttle if i remember correctly that's like right around like indie rock indie rock gold rush times is is what i usually call it i mean it was like 80 89 90 91 this is the entire environment, the entire ecosystem is completely different now uh, for any band, but especially yeah. for, uh, you know, there there was sort of a weird small window of opportunity where the weirdos were let in on some small uh, <laughs> distinct level. And it's got to be interesting to have that kind of history behind you and kind of see folks that are your contemporaries uh, you know, do cool stuff, but then also see things come around and come around and and, and come around again a different time. Like, I mean, it's, it, is, it is very interesting. Yes. It, it, is, it, would you say it's like a cyclical thing as far as uh, music on the whole goes? And where would you say the place of aggressive music is now in relation to the greater overall cultural landscape of art rock. I know it's a kind of like a far sweeping question, but I think you have a unique yeah. voice in this and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, um, you know, on the, on the first question, yes, it, you know, things are definitely cyclical and, and everybody, you know, everybody takes ideas and things cycle around and we, we take those ideas again, but filtered through a different generation's lens, you know, and it's very interesting. You know, some of the artists that I work with, well, it's like I am old enough to be their dad, you know? And so, but they're like, they're like massively into like Nirvana and Mud Honey and, you know, all these kind of bands. And I'm like, you guys were literally not even planned when, <laughs> let alone born. Hey, you weren't even swimming around in, in a testicle at that moment in yeah. time. <laughs> so it's very interesting, you know, and, 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 you know, given, how somebody who's as old as I am might have discovered those kind of bands. And then to see a younger person who's discovered those bands in a completely different way, usually through the internet or mm-hmm. YouTube or whatever. I mean, I think it's awesome, but it, it is interesting. It, it's awesome that, you know, we have that access to like all kinds of great music from, from any year at, at our fingertips. But the downside to that is it does take a little bit of the, the mystery and the magic out of it, you know, which, which has led to a, a bit of a kind of, um, yeah, I don't think that music is as important to people on a deep fundamental level as it, as it was when I was growing up. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just is, you know, um, to answer the second part of your question about aggressive music um, I'm gonna I'm gonna curveball you. 
and I'm going to say I have no idea because I don't really listen to aggressive. <laughs> I haven't Fair. in a long time. And, and it's kind of a, you know, I know a lot of people find it very interesting because they know about my history with Fudge Tunnel and, and playing in a lot of aggressive bands. But the thing is, even with, uh, with those bands, our, our influences were mildly on the aggressive band level but also from a lot of other different places as well so um you know and then certainly as i as i got older i listened to that sort of stuff a lot less so in terms of where that kind of music fits in today i might not be the best person to ask well uh, I, and, and i appreciate the uh the I appreciate the candor as far as that goes, because that is something that I want to bring up. In fact, you hit about three or four things that I think are all very interesting there, one of which is more of an observation than anything else, which is, as you say, it's it's very interesting to find, you know, the kids, uh, air quotes, implied, TM, registered, copyright, getting into these bands and finding immediacy to this music was made like a really long time ago, but then also uh, recontextualizing that with their own experience. So, and, and the, I've I actually overuse this, this example, I feel, but it's a good one is that you get, you get kids that kind of have this idea that carp was somehow as big of a band as the smashing pumpkins or something. And it's like, no, I assure you that is not the case. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and it's just because like, Oh, well, no, those records have hooks They're You know, it's, it's heavy, but it's, it's, it's hooky. It's got a, it, uh, works. And because of that, like they, they continue to live a life, where uh, you know maybe certain flash in the pan indie or uh, alt rock bands didn't. Uh, on that, it's also interesting to see what the kids do with that and where they take that influence and and they do things with. But I think it's also, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned you know being so such so associated with uh, especially Fudge Shunnel, Theory of Ruin, Nail Bomb, very aggro bands, very you know kind of men of a certain age. Uh, find them and are like, yeah, you know, let's not be reductive, but usually men of a certain age. And, you know, the, like the red love stuff is great, but it's, it's you know, it, it's uh, coming from a different world entirely from that. Like at the spatial, like the use, the use of space and soundscape and just, it doesn't even seem like it's, uh, you know, I, I could, I could see somebody being a fan of those bands and being like, am I listening to the right band here? Is this the, is this the same dude? Yeah. Not, can, not thinking the fact there's like a 25 year gap or whatever, right? <laughs> right. Well, that's the, that's the, that's the point that um that I that I wanted to make. You know, is like as much as as you know, most of us change within like two or three years, and m- whatever my tastes were two or three years have definitely changed a little bit up to now. But with you know, with Theory of Ruin, we're talking almost 20 years ago, and with Fudge Tunnel more than 30 years ago. And so, you know, like if I, uh, not that long ago, I was over at my friend's house and he was like, oh, check this out. And he's got his phone and he pulled up like a fudge tunnel YouTube, you know, he's like, look, look, it's you. And I, you know, like I can look at it and I can go, I recognize that, that yeah. bloke. <laughs> and it like, he sort of looks familiar. like, yeah. yeah, like it could be like a cousin that I haven't seen for a long time or, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's more than half my life ago. And so like, yeah, it's me and I can recognize, you know, w- what, what I was feeling at that point, but it's such a long time ago that the, the idea that I would be doing something that's exactly the same 30 or 20 years later seems ridiculous to me, you know? Sure. And I think that's something where, and this speaks to the other point that you made about, uh, you know, the instant availability of everything has led to this interesting cultural landscape where it's not just that things come out all the time and they do, and there's always new stuff, but there's always stuff that already has existed as well. And people can discover it at any given moment in time. And that's a, that's a boon. That's a, that's a wonderful thing, but it also means everything can kind of exist in constant present tense too which is a bizarre thing that i don't think earlier generations really have had to had to deal with certainly not uh, with art or creativity like this is a this is a new thing humans are doing now is the uh yeah. well i totally agree and i and i i've had that same observation it's very interesting yeah so so then if you're 
thinking back to those, you know, 91, 92, mm-hmm. and, like, playing with uh, the bands of the time, like, you know, uh, uh, like Fugazi or Jesus Lizard, or, or like, even, some, like, a band that sort of, like, almost lost, the, like, Silverfish or something along those lines, it does it does it feel like it's oh yeah that's a past life that's like uh you know for doctor who fans it's a previous regeneration you know <laughs> like that uh, i mean do you recognize obviously the experiences are part of who what makes you who you are but is it just so long ago now that it just kind of does it not have the, does it seem like a black and white photo now or does it still have the same resonance to you I think it does seem like a like a black and white photo. But you know, I feel like I feel that way about things from 10 years ago, like living in New York. Like I only moved 4 years ago, but it but they, it that just feels like a different lifestyle, it's a different chapter, you know. So, you know, like I'm like I'm proud of that stuff, Fudge Tunnel, you know, uh for for a, for a band of such simple and aggressive nature with such a ridiculous name, like we did really well. We sold 60,000 albums, you know, which thinking about it now is, is incredible. I, that would get you on then, billboard now. <laughs> well, back then, like 1991, that was like, you dropped 60,000. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's an objective it's failure. Worked. It only sold 6,000. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But to work, we were like, holy shit, 60,000 people liked our music enough to actually put down money for it. Like, that was incredible. What an achievement. So, you know, so like, I'm definitely very proud of, of those times, but you know, um, I've always felt like, you know, like I'm going to be involved in music no matter what. And there's different elements of being involved in music and playing is, and you know, playing and writing and performing is just one of them. So, you know, it, it wasn't really much of a surprise when I found out, like, oh, here's another avenue that you could do creative work in music. It doesn't involve the performance side of it. Yeah, sure. So, and, and I, and I want to kind of get into your, your path to recording. I, I, I do... I do wonder, like, what do you what do you think when you hear, like, if you know, if it comes up extemporaneously or whatever, uh, you know, hit songs in E minor or something, if you hear that album, like, what what comes to mind with that? Does it just feel like a... Is this like a photo album or is it something where you can kind of, you've got enough distance, you can appreciate it as uh, as art now? Yeah, a little, a little of both. Actually, you know, I mean, I, I haven't listened to, to that record for, I mean, since it came out. But very recently, we got asked to do this sort of retrospective for, uh, for a magazine. So it was like 30 year anniversary or whatever is coming up. Um, and... And so, you know, in order to do that effectively, well, maybe I should actually listen to this. Familiarize yourself with the material, yeah. (laughs) The actual songs. Um, And, you know, I was like, wow, it's very interesting. It's very, very simple music, but it is delivered in a a particularly aggressive uh, and, and very dark, humorous manner, which I'd sort of forgotten about, you know. And I think that was that was one thing that that struck with you know there there was a lot of humor and and irony in it, and we were coming from a place where you know we were we were a punk rock band, we were doing aggressive noisy punk rock but and when when the band started it you know it was very like angular gangophory aggressive stuff, but it felt like. I mean, I don't remember exactly, but I think it kind of felt like that stuff isn't is has already been done. Let's try to do something a little bit different with it, and let's try let's try to experiment with sound a little bit. Um, and we really loved Dinosaur Junior. We were abs- all three of us obsessed with Dinosaur Junior. But you know, we couldn't play like that well. Like, there's no way I could play like the solos like Jay I and mean, you know, the simple like, yeah. minor and chords and, and all that kind of stuff. So basically what we did is we just sort of like, okay, let's just simplify the most basic stuff that Dinosaur Jr. is doing, which ultimately is just like giant guitar riffs, you know, like Big Muff model and just blasting out these huge guitar riffs. And so that's kind of like how Fudge Tunnel was, was, came to be. A lot of people, and I'm, I don't blame them, 
But a lot of people misunderstood that as this is a metal band. Right. You know? Yes. And I so when that important. came out, you know, and, and remember, this is before grunge. This is 1989, 1990, right? So the, the G word didn't exist. <laughs> and so, you know, it was hard for us because when we went to get gigs, you know, people would be like, what are you? You're not a metal. There's no solos. You, you know, there's no double kick drums. But you're not punk either. You're way too yeah. slow and heavy. You know, it's and not so punk. We like, it's not classic rock. You know, it's not no, metal. It, yeah, so what is it? Us, we were a punk rock band. Yeah. We were just we just decided to play slower and heavier because we felt like the hardcore world was was kind of done. You know, like and we loved all that stuff, all those hardcore bands. But it was um, it had just been done to death. So we wanted to do something a little bit different. You know, Fudge Tunnel was perennially misunderstood as being a metal band. And I'm, I'm not surprised, but, uh, but it still bothers me to this day, you know? Because like I said, there's, there's nothing about it re to me that's metal. And, you know, so sometimes people will send me, sometimes people will email me like, oh, check out my band, you know, and I'll, I'll listen to it. Like doomy stoner sludgy <laughs> right, metal. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, why the fuck did you send this to me? Like I don't I don't listen to this. And I, and I and I didn't even back then. You know? Right. Like doing Fudge Tunnel, like I was listening to Killing Joke, Sisters of Mercy. I had discovered Melvin's and was totally obsessed with Melvin's. So obviously that's a huge, huge influence. But like all that kind of like donary to me kind of stuff. Like I've never had any interest in that, that stuff. To me, it's just humorless and it's just so. So Fudge Tunnel was much more of this kind of like, I don't know what it what is a angular band that just happened to be extremely heavy. King of Four, I think is a, is a good example because, you know, people, people think of them either musically or for, you know, their incredible social commentary, but you know, there was a kind of a dark sense of humor to everything they did as well. Yeah, and, and it was for to me was, was the big one in terms of playing bar because, you know, I was yeah, growing yeah. up playing bar and I had my chord book, you know, and I went along to Hendrix trying to figure out these complicated chords. And I was like, okay, a, this doesn't really interest me that much. And B it's fucking difficult, you know, like it's like, I just want to get straight to the more expressive stuff. And then, uh, and then I heard Gang, and I was like, "Oh my God, this guy's one note." Yeah, and, the, over it's, and it's the two. best thing ever, right? It's amazing <laughs> thing ever. Yeah, and so that was a huge influence. And and you can hear tunnel. There's so much stuff that's that's one note stuff, you know. But instead of Andy Gill doing it kind of clean, I didn't want to do that because it's already been done. So my thing was like, okay, let's just put on a, a big muff and, and go for a totally different angle. But it's the same idea of that, like express versus you know like i actually structured chords and you know which also shows why you had such common cause with melvin's because melvin's were also coming from a similar place that you know it's a very punk background yeah totally yeah it's like it's like dada metal or dada, dada. Yeah, there's some beef heart in there there's some devo in there you know like it's it's and it's it, it's humor in music is is frequently misunderstood and i think a lot of people have a feeling that, you know, if you inject any humor to stuff that, you know, you're on your way to a Weird Al knockoff act or something. <laughs> and it's, it's especially... Well, it has to be done to... It's a it very... It has to be done well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a fine line between clever and stupid. Um, the right no, kind of know, stupid is, is wonderful. The wrong kind of stupid is abhorrent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was, you know, there was like a bunch of these hardcore bands that we used to go and see back in England, you know, that were, they were kind of this like jokey, hokey, like punk stuff, you know? And I'd just be like, this is fucking awful. This is just like bad, bad jokes, you know? Um, so it has to be a certain style of humor. Yeah. And it's, it's the the dark humor certainly came across and 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 I think that's actually one of the reasons why that band kind of endures some of the same reasons that maybe made you a bit of a, an outlier at the time is something that when people discover it now they can give it whatever context they want and that the, what they can do is they can find something that they identify with in there and still be like oh no these are also good riffs and it's it's cool to hear you contextualize that because it's it's some of my favorite folks to talk to are folks that lived through that era but again, 
they were uh, around and doing it either during or slightly before the big gold rush (laughs) where suddenly everyone wants to be like the next Nirvana or something, which is insane to think about now because that idea is just like, what? There's no, there's no way you could ever like have like a cultural flashpoint like that. And I mean, I, I, I liken it to, you know, in Star Trek, the Borg, you know, they, 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 they fight certain enemies and they learn the enemies weaknesses and they, you can't use that anymore. It's like, okay, that's yeah, that, the, yeah. the Borg learned from that one. Uh, but then it's interesting, too, that you invoke Dinosaur Jr. because that's a band I think that was sort of lost to time for a while and then had a resurgence and people kind of found out yeah, about them yeah, again. They're a very interesting band because they, you know, they kind of didn't really get swept. I mean, I know they did get signed to a major label and they did well, but it, but nothing compared to, you know, Smashing Pumpkins or Nirvana or that, that kind of level. Yeah, and then sort of disappeared for a while. And then had a huge resurgence with, you know, I think some of the old fan base that sort of rediscovered them and a whole new generation of fans as well. So it's pretty incredible. And it's also, and, and I don't want to, we got a lot to talk to, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but it's hard to imagine now, but there definitely was a divide between like the punk rockers and the metalheads back mm-hmm. when. And like now it's like, oh, well, why it's all weirdo aggressive music why would you not be into like all of these other things and there definitely for a long time was that divide like oh you could be in this camp or that camp which again seems as absurd as the quote-unquote selling out argument which dominated a lot of uh, zines and print media and and other things in the 90s but you know it's that that aspect of it was was huge and it and it was very hard because you know like like I, I mentioned about when, you know, for us getting, just getting bookings was difficult enough because if, if you, if, if they couldn't pigeonhole you into a specific genre, it was impossible, you know? And then, and the, you know, they'd say, well, what band do you sound like? And we'd be like, well, none, we don't sound like any band. Well, just name one, just name one. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's very difficult to do. And what's, of course, what's kind of like the cruel other side of that is those are the bands that, um, you know, in a lot of cases will tend to endure and <clears throat> kind of have something to offer because simply because they didn't sound like everything else that was a- around them at the time. Yeah. And, you know, it's almost like, can you, <laughs> you know, think of all, think of like the legions of slint imitators or Fugazi imitators and whatnot that like, oh, they, they, they took one thing that that band does. And they like kind of did it to death, like drove it into the ground. And, you know, I guess they're having fun. It ain't hurting anyone in the larger scheme of things, like good on them. But I, you know, I don't want to listen to it. But yeah, but what, what's the point? At what cost? Yeah, well, I wouldn't. Yeah, not, not of interest to me, not of interest to, I think, a lot of the folks that, that would uh, be into the show and, and things along those lines. So wh- when did you actually start recording? Like what, what was your path into engineering and, and recording music not just playing but recording music literally the first the first time the fudge tunnel cut a demo so it'd be like 89 you know and we went we went into a studio uh, this guy dave had a, had a studio in nottingham it was very small small studio but you know there was a tape machine there was a console and i was just instantly oh my god this is incredible this is a machinery that's capturing the sound this is amazing so you know like i had a four track and i'd sort of messed around with four track and stuff like that but this was this was a whole other level you know um and then uh very quickly after that we got signed and got to do uh a couple of records and um i just got bitten like immediately by this by this recording vibe um so like pretty much from the from the uh from the start of the band really but you know i also knew like okay well we're doing this band and i have these commitments to tour and um it's hard to balance you know, those I'm things yeah i learn this this stuff but i also know that you know just like any craft is not going to happen overnight and it's going to take me a long time to learn how to do this stuff well and so this is my long-term goal that, you know, by the mid nineties or late nineties, I'll be in a position where I'll know what I'm doing. 
Um, so, you know, so I had interest the whole time and did end up producing the, the last Fudge Tunnel record. But, um, so, yeah. So how was it? That was your, was that your first experience kind of being on both sides of it there? Uh, with as far yeah, as recording well, and playing it, and whatnot? I mean, like even from Hate Songs, you know, on Hate Songs, we worked with a producer, fantastic producer, Colin Richardson. Right. And, you know, and Colin really sort of took me under under his wing and you know and and i think i probably mentioned or i probably didn't even have to mention like oh, i have a real interest in this recording game and so he was kind of like cool let's do this together and let me show you some of the tricks and he was incredible just incredible you know so i learned so much from him a, a lot of the things i learned from him were things not to do you know I was just gonna he, say that it's almost the most important thing his, right <laughs> yeah he had his way of doing things one of his one of his things that he was really obsessed with was total separation of every instrument, you know, to the, literally to the point where every instrument is bone dry and can't be recorded in the same room because that room sound might bleed in, you know, and, yeah. and I'd be like, zero but we're bleed. <laughs> instruments separately. Like, how could it possibly bleed? And he's like, no, I, I just don't want any of the room sound in it whatsoever, you know? Mm. And I'd be like, oh, okay, that's cool. That's cool. And then, you know, we'd be, yeah. <laughs> you know, come to mixing and we'd be like weeks into mixing and I'd be like, what's going on? Like, what's going on with the mixing? And he'd be like, oh, well, you know, it's difficult because everything's so separated and I'm trying to make it sound like it was all recorded in one. <laughs> so I was like, uh, okay. Mental note. Yeah, yeah. Take a, take a note. note. You file it away for future reference. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, on, on on another record, we got to work with Ian Burgess, was which he was a uh, Ian Burgess, yeah, uh, really incredible, incredible. I, I'm not going to call him a producer because he, I think he was more of an engineer, but he was an exceptional engineer. And um, you know, we were we were recording, and um, I think we did a, we did a take, and we got this fantastic version and Adrian, the drummer suddenly sort of like pulled these fills out of nowhere that he hadn't done before. And we were like, Oh my, like we were playing, looking at each other, like, Holy shit. Great. Yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. What, wh how did he come up with this? And then right on the very last bar, he totally fucked it. <laughs> and so we were like, Oh no, wow. no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, and so, which is so a, we're insane like, to think about in, in terms of today's recording and, and, and digital and, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it's just like, oh, well, all right, that's that's boned. <laughs> well, actually, actually, as it turns out, Ian was just like, well, we have two takes of that song because he did a version earlier that was like really straight, didn't have those films. And I was like, yeah, man, if only there was a way to take that new version with all the cool films and then just like take the ending from the other one, right. but there's no way to. <laughs> yeah. And, and he's just like over at the tape machine with a razor blade and he's not even looking at it, you know? Yeah. He's like, he's, he's got his guys back to the tape machine and he's like, did you see that football game on Saturday? <laughs> when Wolverhampton got that last goal. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa what are you doing? What are you <laughs> oh, he's, uh, he's off the deep end. He's cutting the tape up. Yeah. Man, I got it. I got it. I got it. And he like, you know, he cut the tape, spliced it with a piece of sticky tape, right? Yeah, rebound it. Didn't even look at it. He just hit play, and it went by like totally seamless. And I was just like, mind blown, <laughs> totally blown. So I said, I said to Ian, "You have to show me how to do this." And he was like, eh. "And I was like, no, you have to show me how to do this. I will not leave until you show me how to do this." And he's like, "All right." Go down, go down to the shop, get me a six pack of the strongest beer you can find. And I'll show you how to do this. Good to show you. So that's how I learned, I learned tape editing. And that Ian was, he was incredible. Incredible. And now any punk kid with a garage band install can just do it by pointing and clicking. But back in my day. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, and it's, it's a hell of a lot easier. It certainly is. I, I miss the sound of tape, but editing on tape is is difficult. I was gonna say it's and not it's not tape op, and I don't want to want to get too into it. But I, 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 there are purists still 
and you know the tape versus digital producer versus engineer you know the, these are the the evergreen topics of anyone that records music that <laughs> always pop up like the bad penny but if you want to give quick thoughts on your internal differentiation between the uh, producer and engineer role and also what you like about tape versus digital and your general ethos on that that'd be wonderful Okay, well, I, I think that, um, you know, there's definitely something magical about, about the sound of tape, and, a, and, a, and I do prefer it to, to digital, but we also have to be realistic about the, the time and the situation that we're, that we're in. What I will say is that I'm extremely grateful that I grew up in a time when bands were recording on tape, and you had... Uh, a limited amount of tracks to work with. And so you had to be very creative and you had to make decisions. And that was what people like Colin and Ian instilled in me. You make decisions as you go. There's none of this. No leave take it backs. To- yeah. <laughs> but, you, know, you record stuff and we don't have, we don't have unlimited tracks. So anything that gets recorded better be really damn good. Otherwise, why is it there? So you know, you put a lot of effort into making stuff work together as you go and you build the record up. And, and I think, you know, you can tell records that are done that way compared to, um, you know, some records that are made these days where there's just like a million things are thrown in there on limited tracks yeah. and then like, okay, we'll figure it all out later. And, and the reality is you can't figure it out because it wasn't, it wasn't developed as it went. It was just a bunch of stuff thrown together. And hey, you might be able to make it stick. Sometimes it does, but there's no guarantee of it. So for me, it's not so much the sound of tape, but it's that mindset. It's the it's that process of like, hey, we're just adding way too much stuff at this point. Let's let's scale it back, or you know, or um, there's been stuff when, like, for example, when when Pro Tools first came out, you know, and. And I was kind of like, this is incredible. You can like move stuff around and you can cut stuff up and it's, it's amazing. And I remember working with one band and the bass player was perpetually late. <laughs> Every single note that he hit was late, you know? And I would say to him, hey, dude, you're like, you're really dragging the bass. And he'd be like, I know, I know. I don't know why I do that. I'm sorry. And I'm like, it's cool. Let's do it again. And he'd do it again, and he'd play late all the time. And I'd go, okay, let me turn up the click track. Let me turn up the kick drum. I right. want you to really listen, listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> and he'd be like, okay, okay, I got it. And he'd play it, and it would be totally late. And I'd be like, okay, fine. Let's call it for today. And so then, you know, I would get up on the Pro Tools, and you could see it. There's the kick drum, and there's the, ba- there's the bass, right? You can see it's late. So I'm like, right, I'm just going to move it. So I de- take all the bass notes one at a time and move them onto the kick drum. It took me hours, you know? Right. And I was like, whoa, check this out. Now I hit play. It's going to sound awesome. And my jaw dropped, not because of how good it sounded, but because of how shit it sounded. Because <laughs> it had no feel at all, right? Yeah, it had no feel and it had no low end. <laughs> the bass, oh, no. With the bass drum and the kick hitting at the exact same time. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Up, right? Yeah, yeah. You have to. It was a huge eureka for me. It's like you have to have that little bit of distance between those two instruments for them each to have their space. And if you try to force them literally on the grid on top of each other, they can't exist together. There isn't room for them to exist together. So undid everything that I did and put it back to exactly how he played it and hit play. And I was like, now it sounds right. So, you know, that that whole world of getting into like putting stuff on the grid and and it it's really hard sometimes to resist it, you know, because it's, it's a slippery it's slope. So, <laughs> yeah, it really is a slippery slope. So, you know, like, you know, I was try to, I, I was just try to like avoid looking at the screen too much and, and kind of go, well, how does it feel? How does it sound? Not how does it look? Cause it's, that's a really, really dangerous thing to get into. Yeah. Computer as, recording apparatus purely rather than looking at it as as another instrument to uh 
<laughs> to take away any and all humanity from the, the recording. Right. Well, Fox is a musical, you know, and, and, you know, my job as a producer is to make something that, that sounds real, but sometimes people make the mistake and they think that that means that it needs to be literally perfect, that, that music production is like ironing out anything that, that could possibly not be on the grid or not be perfect. Sure. Or, to me, that's not what production is. To me, production is capturing a feeling, capturing a vibe that translates to the listener. And, you know, for example, uh, guitars, electric guitars, often sound better when they're a little bit out, like slightly late, slightly rushed for a bit of energy. Behind or, or ahead of the beat a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. That's a vital part of what makes rock music, you know? And, okay, it has to be within reason. If, if there's a really horrendous <laughs> note right. that rubs the vocal, like, yeah, we probably need to punch that in. You're not recording but, Jandek here, yeah. <laughs> right. But, you know, you have to really use your... your taste with it and and um i think for a lot of people that's it's it must be very difficult for them because i hear these records that are just literally pitch perfect grid perfect and when i hear that stuff it like it literally like puts me off music you know <laughs> right I, I just have to like i notice that the next day like hey i didn't really listen to any music today it's that it's kind of like the first time i ever heard post malone you know, yeah. I heard all these people talking about Post Malone. I was like, I don't know what that is, but I should I should probably go and listen to it so I know what it is. I thought it was a I, genre. I was like, what? I never heard of Malone. What genre of music is that? I listened to one Post Malone song and I couldn't listen to any kind of music for three days straight. It just like it just ruined music for me so bad. Oh man, it's kind of like getting bit by a dog, right? It's like all of a sudden you're like, fuck dogs. Away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I need to avoid dogs really, really bad for a while. And, and so that's how I feel about, you know, some of that like really super processed stuff. Well, and I think you, and you somewhat answered the, you know, the, the great tape op question, the, the producer versus engineer thing. And what level of your own opinion, your own self do you instigate? And where does that line kind of cross over? I mean, you have people that literally will, help write or arrange the songs you know in some cases in some cases you have the school of thought you know like let's just let's not kid ourselves the steve albini school of like i'm here to to document this i'm going to you know push the button and get and try to not try to influence unduly this thing that you are bringing i'm going to try to capture it the best that i can right and i think all of those are very valid i mean the, you know the thing about being a, a producer is there's no there's no, there's no certificate for it. There's no credential for it. You know what I mean? There's no job description. So really a producer is whatever you decide a producer is. I mean, um, I think when I first started, because I did come from this more punk rock kind of background, and I, I feel like, you know, I kind of felt like the, the Rick Rubens of the world, like rearranging people's songs for them and yeah. like, you know, like let's me let's me let's all meditate on this song so we get the right you know <laughs> like in my, in my younger yeah. days I, you know I would definitely uh, I would definitely speak in pejorative terms about about those types of people. You had opinions, and, and that's fine. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, you know, and so that's how I operated for a while. I was, it was like strictly like recording and not really offering much in the way of production, but I quickly realized that in many cases there is a genuine need for, you know, for help from an experienced right. producer outside opinion that can be so helpful for people. And it, what level of that takes place, you know, varies greatly. So, you know, you have some bands that are um, that are maybe already very experienced and they're three or four records in and they, some bands I've worked with even have their own studio. So clearly, you know, what they need compared to a brand new artist that comes to me with totally unfinished songs is two different things. And I adjust it every single time, you know. So sometimes I do write with people or I'll take their half finished songs and help them finish it or, you know, or 
guide them in the right path to help them finish it. Some of the artists I work with, their songs are finished and, and I, I just need to work on getting the right vibe and the right sounds for those songs to work. So it's, it's different every, every time, but it's, it's very, very rare that I like just press record. And I, you know, and I know there is that, that mindset to it, but I have found in my experience that it's, it's shortchanging artists that, that virtually every artist can benefit from some input. You have this learned experience, you know, there, there's mistakes that maybe you have, you've seen bands make or artists make in the past that you can be like, Oh, you know, here's why you may not want to do that. You know? Right. And, exactly. And you don't need, all you can do is, you know, you present the case, <laughs> you know, you don't need to be a jerk about it or anything, but I think the advantage to, to working with someone that has that experience is they have that experience. And yeah. I, I, I grow irritated of hearing stories of people working with the uh, producers or engineers that just, they feel that they know everything and it's like, well, okay, then, okay. If you know everything, then why do you need someone else to help you? Like <laughs> you should yeah. be able to do this yourself. Right. <laughs> Right, exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, like, the, it's a constant learning experience. And, and I look forward to every session. And, it, you know, even some of the sessions that I know are going to be very difficult, I still look forward to them because it's, it's always a learning experience. There's always something that I l learn from it and advance just that little bit further. Um, and, you know, recording it, Recording music, there's there's definitely a lot of curveballs because you know there's things like um, there are certain things that you know you develop definitely along the way and like okay this is I found something that works really well let's say it's recording drums or it's recording bass guitar I found like this mic or this compressor it sounds awesome on this bass cabinet so I'm gonna do it every time that's gonna be my thing you know and so I'll I'll go through phases where I do that and then an artist comes in and I do that same thing and it just totally does not work at all. It sounds awful. It's not, it's not one size fits all, right? <laughs> you know, I'm not thrown for a second because I'm like, what the hell? It, it worked the last three times. But then suddenly I have this moment of elation where I'm like, this is awesome because I get to figure out something new that will work in this case. And I really love that challenge of it. So we're and I, I promise we'll get out of the wayback machine eventually and and very soon. But I I am very curious because I don't think I've ever heard the story of how Nail Bomb came to pass. And it occurs to me that what I do know of it, there's probably a closer analog to a lot of musical projects now, in a lot of ways, uh, amongst the, I hate to say it, but indie rock world, even though it's not necessarily the correct term. How did that come to pass, and what was it like? Uh, making that with with Max because it seems like that's a a wild coming from a wildly different place from what you were doing with Fudge Tunnel at the time as far as making the songs touring the songs recording the songs etc cetera, etc cetera. this is something where the songs came first you're creating the studio and it, it seems like a very different type of thing that again wouldn't be out of place as a project in more contemporary situations. Right, right. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I think that that kind of thing, you know, that the like rock super group. In <laughs> I was really trying hard not to say that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. we, we, can, we can say it because it's, it's, it's a simple, it's a simple and effective term to use. But it, it certainly was not common that uh, the cross pollination of different artists back in those days was not common. Um, you know, Nail Bomb is an, is an interesting one for me because I never spend very much time thinking or talking about it. Um, largely because I think of all the work that I've done or, or all my musical output, mm -hmm. it's the one that interests me the least. And the reason for that is really, um, you know, I, I just never took that as a serious project whatsoever. And, and I, I don't think that Max did either. And essentially, you know, as you pointed out, it was, for us, that was kind of a reaction about, you know, you're, you're signed to a label, you've got your album cycle, you've got your tour cycle, you've got your, you know, you've got to have a bio, you've got to deliver by this date, you know. And, and for both of us, that 
you know, the, those kind of commitments are a, a bit tiring. And, and yeah. you know, we would sit around and, and like, I just moved to America and I, and I was hanging out with Max. And we, we didn't have the same musical taste, but there was some crossover. Like, we both really loved Dead Kennedys and, and uh, that kind of punk stuff, right? Right. So I was kind of surprised because, you know, Max is like in this metal band. And I was kind of surprised that, you know, he was talking about all these punk bands. But it feels like that was where some common cause was because just as, again, he's playing in a heavier band and it's, you know, for lack of a better term, a metal band, right? But it's coming from a place that's not necessarily where those same influences are coming from. Like he's bringing in his right. influence. Exactly, right. You know, he was, Max, like, writing those records, he's listening to Dead Kennedys and Beastie Boys and, you know, all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't expect. And so I was like, oh, this guy's cool. He's got a really varied taste. And, and so we were basically both in town at the same time. It was an off, it was in between album cycles. There was no touring. And we, so we were kind of like waiting for our cycles to start back up again. And we were literally like, let's just fuck around. Let's just jam. Right. Like, I think I can play Holiday in Cambodia. Let's do it, you know? And, uh, and that's what it was. It was just like, it was just fun. We, he had this jam pad and we would go down to the jam pad they had all their equipment, you know, like huge amps because they had from being on tour, right? So we literally like these walls of amps <laughs> and we play a holiday in, in Cambodia. Yeah, that sounds like a good way to spend a day, right? <laughs> it was awesome. You know, but then somebody, you know, I think their manager at some point was like, oh, you guys, you know, you guys are having so much fun with this. Like, you should make a record of it, you know? Yeah. And we were like, well, this, this is just cover, cover versions. <laughs> well, write your own song. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think people might dig this, and we were like, "No, who the hell is going to listen to this shit?" You know, <laughs> but we're like, <laughs> and so you know, like very much, very much a reaction to like that whole world of like, you know, of being signed to a label and working with a label, and you know, the, the you careerist have to, side of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like even labels that are cool, like they still have a vested interest in 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 the outcome and they want to have somewhat of a say in it and a lot of times that's valid but it also gets tiring you know and i think max and i were both in a very similar place where we're kind of like look we just want to be able to just throw down stuff and just have fun with this because that's what it was supposed to be all about yeah you know? exactly it's that the whole idea was to play without expectations and without a yeah. framework of so we had, stuff. you know like you had a rule about lyrics you know like in fudge tunnel lyrics were complex and were worked and reworked over and over again and agonized over and, you know, and it's a, a lengthy process, you know? And so we made a decision with Nail Bomb, you write a lyric, here's a pen, here's a paper, and you have 10 minutes. And at the end of 10 minutes, you know, the little bell goes off, like the Jeopardy bell goes off. <laughs> do, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Countdown, you know, the countdown bell, 10 minutes, you're done. Whatever's on that paper, that's what it's it done. Is. If it's not finished, then you can just repeat some part of it because we just, you know, this is like a real, just like early rock and roll mentality of just really simple basics, you know, off the, off the cuff stuff. And so, you know, from that angle, like how much fun It's really awesome. Right. You just throw stuff down and just not give a shit, not agonize over it, you know, just super fun. And, you know, and it is a fun record, and that may sound weird to say it's a <laughs> there's a fun record, but it it and it's not. Yeah, no, I'm glad, glad you said that. Yeah, because it is. It, that's it was really fun to do it, and it was, and and I hope that that comes across. It's definitely very aggressive. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, I was at that time, still am, totally obsessed with Nine Inch Nails, um, and got really into the the sampling world. Um, which you know, so we got to figure this is like what 94. So, I mean, that's also, yeah, that that's a, that's a good time to be get into that. Cause the technology is just get starting to get really good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, we were listening to a lot of like public enemy, nine inch nails, obviously. So that, that kind of sampling world and mixing that with, with this kind of like super aggressive rock stuff. It was really fun. But the, the issue is for me is that, you know, I just see that album as sort of throwaway and then, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's what it was. That's, it was its purpose. But, you know, 
people took it very seriously. It ended up selling way more records than Fudge Tunnel ever did. Right. And that that always bothered me, you know, because that, that's was, the side project's curse, right? What if it's more successful than the thing you like sink your heart and soul into? <laughs> and for something that was that was basically like thrown together with with not very much care can do, you know, can sell a lot of records and so you know, <laughs> instead of the stuff you labored on and you know spend so much time yeah, yeah. and effort with and you're like oh i guess all you have to do is just play some dead kennedy songs on big amps and uh off you, on you go <laughs> i think we literally sampled dead kennedy's there's all kinds of samples on i that. mean even there's the record a- cover even looks like a dead kennedy's cover to me you know where it's got like the, the v- uh, was it the Viet Cong uh the gun like to the he- i mean it's like yeah, totally totally, total, totally. <laughs> In a good way, like not not as a ripoff, like as as a in the same vein, um, you know, taking the spirit of that kind of thing. I don't want to say, right. it. yeah. But you know, it it because that record did so well, there was definitely a lot of pressure. Like, oh, we need to like set up touring and we need to make this a thing, you know. And I was like, I don't want to do it. You know, Fudge Tunnel is my band we were just in between album cycles and I want to go back to that. That's, you know, that's the stuff that I'm more proud of that is, that is more accomplished to me. And nail bomb is super fun and it, and it's great, but like, I, that's not really what I want to be known for. And, you know, so basically I quit and I know that I let a lot of people down with that and I, yeah. and I do feel bad, but um, that's, I, I couldn't do it with my, with my heart in it to that level, you know? Well, and you know what would be worse? Would it would quitting it or being in it and doing it and not really being all there for it? You know, right. Well, exactly. Far worse. I tried. We did, I, we did do one show. We did a show in Eindhoven, Holland, and it's on YouTube. You can look. Oh, it really? up. I, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah, Google. It's Nail Bomb at Dynamo Festival, and you will see the utter misery in my face. <laughs> People email me, you know, like why are you so miserable? You know? And I'm like, I didn't want to be there. Like I did, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to take, I didn't want that project to be taken that seriously. I want to put time into it. I didn't really want to be known for it. Right. And I, I just was miserable. And so that's when I realized I need to this before, before it gets too well. And you know, before it gets really out of hand. And, and you know, I'm not, inter- I'm not interested in making this, you know, the true story of nail bomb podcast or anything, but uh, well, a few years back, Max uh, was played the record on tour with his band, right? And I think was like what having that distance from it. I mean, did you ever have any like thoughts to like, oh, maybe you could, yeah, try that and see if that no. if that works now, or was it just sort of like, no, man, <laughs> no, no interest whatsoever. I haven't for for such a long time, you know. And they they you know they asked for years. They asked me, you know, to do to do touring or do another record, and I was just like. There's no way. Like, it's not where my head is at. But it wasn't where my head was at when we made the record. Right. Let alone, you know what I mean? Let alone after it. So there's no way. And you know, then they said, "Well, what if we go out and tour it without you?" And I was like, "That's cool. I'll do whatever I can to help, and I'll like arrange all the samples to be played and all that stuff." But but do I want to be a part of it? No. Right. I like. Like I've moved on. Like I'm doing like other stuff. You know yeah, what I mean? yeah. So I, I, it's the same thing with Fudge Tunnel, where people talk, you know, to ask Fudge about reunion. It's like I've like I've moved on. Like I'm doing like so much other stuff. I, I don't really have any desire to to it's like go a million back. Years on. ago, too. I mean, it's sort of like yeah, right. Yeah, it just there's there's no point to me. I just I want to be always moving forward. You know. So then. So if if you can, because it's not something I'm immediately f- familiar with, how did that band end up disbanding? Like, what was it? Did it kind of uh, was it an abrupt thing, or was it more of a did it sort of just peter out? Fudge tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> um. And I well, swear Fudge we're going to get out of the early '90s eventually. Don't worry. <laughs> I like you know I like talking about it because it is like it is a part of my past, and even though. You know, as we talked about, it feels almost like a different poem, but it's not. It's it's cool to talk about some of these sort of things, like you okay, know, good. like like nail bomb. Like I very rarely talk about it, and it's cool to like explain what actually happened with it. You know, I think it's a, uh, I think it's an interesting record, and 
like I said, it's almost like 10 years, 12 years before it's time or something, you know, in, in the way that it all came together. And I think that that's kind of something that doesn't get talked about a lot. So I'm glad you wanted to, are okay with taking the time for it. But yeah, Fudge Tunnel was your, that's your main squeeze. That's your main thing. Yeah. Well, Fudge Tunnel, we, you know, we'd, we'd always had this sort of running joke that we were just going to make one album and then split up, you know. It was it was like a punk rock thing, right? right. So, like, you know, we don't want to just stick around and end up just being like a poor imitation of ourselves or whatever. Um, and then we made a second album, you know. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then, it turns out you did a shit job at that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know... I don't know that we were necessarily looking for a way out. I don't want to say that, but, but what, you know, I'd moved to America. So like, we're now like, it's already difficult. Yeah. (laughs) yeah, So like practicing twice a week is suddenly not going to happen. It gets really Um, expensive really quick as it turns out. Yeah. yeah. Um, And I think the biggest issue really was that we despised our record label and they despised us. And so it was clearly, you know, it was clearly something that was not going to change. And we were contracted. There was no way really out of it. And so with all those things combined, I think it was, it just was clearly time. But it is something that, that I regret because um, in, in one way I regret because some of the, final things that we actually did with the band we actually we got asked to to cover a wire song for nice. a compilation yeah and you know i think at this time we i think we already knew we were going to split and like we just didn't care and and that uh, that song that we did the wire cover version is one of my favorite things that we ever did um and so i can look back on it and go i think if we'd done another album it would have been really radically different and much more interesting, you know, but at the same time, there's, there's nothing you can do. Like if the, if the time has come, the time has come, you know, so there's, there's no no point, but I, I do feel like, God, I wish we just, I wish we'd just like taken a break for a year instead, you know, but, but the reality is like, you really can't. And that like, like that idea bit me in the ass years later with at the drive-in. You know, with, with, with at the drive-in when they, uh, you know, they were getting ready to break up and, you know, everything was just in tatters. And Omar called me up and, you know, and I'd said to him, like, my one word of advice or my one sentence of advice is just don't tell people that you're breaking up because uh, back in those days, 1999, 2000, you know how that, like these days people do all the time they break up and then they get back together. Yeah, like, yeah. and that that's part of the that's part of the cycle now. It's yeah. like, oh no, they broke yeah. up for a while. <laughs> right. It's a gimmick at this point. But back in those days, like you could not do it. Like what if once you announced to the world like we broke up, like that's that was it. it. You would, that's over. You know, yeah. drop from your label, you would be it would be done, you know? Starting and from so zero I, if you tried to come back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I said to Omar, like, don't announce that you're breaking up because can't come back from that yeah. just like if you if you guys need to take six months out and just rest that's cool but just tell people like you're on hiatus or something you know you don't right. you don't have to see you're breaking up so of course they announced a hiatus which turned into nine months which turned into a year and you know at, at some point, some word got around that it was my suggestion that they go on this hike. <laughs> so then I'd have what people, what I'd dickhead go, suggested this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, which one came up with this? So then I'd have people asking me, like, what's going on with the hiatus? You know, and I'd be like, how the fuck should I know? I'm not in the fucking band. You know? <laughs> yeah, why, why, did, why did you ask the band exactly? Right, yeah. So, um, so there you go. So Fudge Tunnel Split, uh, you know, it was the right time to do it, but... Um, but uh, I suppose there's always some like mild feel of regret when something ends like that. Well, and you, and and so when you're in a situation like that where you're in a band for a really long time, it's a huge part of your life. It's 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 a part of how you plan everything in your life. You you plan you know around you know there's touring, you're making the records, like you're writing songs, etc. So. I mean, did you, 
did you miss it? I mean, you'd already, you'd already moved, you moved to a new country. So, so there's that. But I mean, what, was it surreal at first? Like, where was that, like, not having that as, as a big part of your life anymore? Uh, where was that in your headspace at the moment? Well, here's the, here's the, the pertinent point is that I personally hated touring, you know? I hated being away from home. I, like, I laying the shows, the 40, 40 to 45 minutes on stage every night. Yeah, that part's Incredible. great. <laughs> yeah. It was just the other 23 and a quarter hours of the day, you know, and being stuck in a van with people who were my friends who and I loved, loved to death, but like, I don't want to be stuck in a van with anybody, no matter how much I love them. Eventually, it's going to get old, you know, and I was already sort of into the recording world and the studio world and started thinking like, Boy, don't I just love like pottering around in the studio and messing with right. tape machines a lot more than like sitting in it. That, in that was band. probably sparking more joy than yeah, like watching the highway for eight hours as you wait for your forty forty five minutes to come alive, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like I, I I started smoking on tour because you know I never smoked before, but it was just Something like to sheer, do. yeah, it's ridiculous, you I know, mean, and. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that I did it. And it was, you know, back in those days, certainly as well, the early touring, you know, we did crazy stuff that just seems like unthinkable these days. Like, you like, you know, there was no hotels. And, and like yeah. one night we didn't have anywhere to stay with Fudge Tunnel, touring in Germany in the, like in the middle of winter, nowhere to stay. You know, we're driving through the night, like nowhere really to go, yeah. exhausted. We're like, fuck it. Let's just sleep here. But there wasn't room in the van for all of us. We had a driver and a, and a sound person. Two of us got out of the van and got in our sleeping bags in the side of the freeway, the highway in, the in ditch. Germany. <laughs> in the ditch. Oh, and went to sleep. You know, probably yeah. like, probably like totally hammered. So it's fine. You know, you <laughs> yeah. one. Like, wake up in the morning like oh slight headache but whatever fuck it where's the show you know? yeah but, like, th- and that's just, that's the kind of thing you you get like almost the uh, the soldier like mentality where you're like whatever doesn't matter i'm laying down yeah. now i'm asleep <laughs> and it was awesome you know it was amazing what an experience it's fantastic and i wouldn't change it for the world but i did also get to a point mid-20s where i was like uh, i don't know that this is all that much fun and uh, this after four years it, yeah. it loses and, its luster or touch, yes. <laughs> yes, and the, and the you know, and the you know, the backstage that the smells of piss and the whole you know. Like I said, I wouldn't change it for the world, but I it wasn't hard for me to imagine like I want to be spending more time in the studio than than doing this side of it. So what's so on that? I mean, did you did you feel in ease with recording other bands? from the outset or did it take you a while to kind of get to the point in your head? You're like, Oh yeah, I, I know how to do this. And this is something I feel comfortable doing. Like where, where was the dividing line for feeling like a professional? Maybe where I'm going. With That's it. A good question. And well, when I first started, you know, I didn't know fully how to work all the tape machines and the console and all that stuff. Like I had an idea, but like that stuff takes a long time. So I would be hiring engineers and I would be working as a producer uh, you know, and that was cool. But then I felt like the engineers I was working with weren't getting the sound I was looking for. And I kind of felt like if you want something done right, you know, so, okay, I'm going to learn how to become an engineer as well as producer. Right. So then I sort of like took some time out. and then And then what I did at that point was I... I was like bands would ask me to work with them and my, you know, my response was like, I'll do it. But here's the thing. I don't fully know what I'm doing. <laughs> full disclosure. So, <laughs> right. Yeah, full disclosure. I don't know what I'm doing. So a, I can't charge any money. Yeah. And B, it might go horribly wrong and will be a complete waste of time, but you won't lose any money because you don't have to pay me anything. And so I did that. I did that for several years, you know, picking up more and more until I felt like I was in a position where, okay, I, I know what I'm doing and I feel like it's legit for people to pay me 
at least something for this. Right. To be compensated for what are indeed professional services because you are a professional, but you have, Ooh, to, right. you have to almost cross that Rubicon in your mind first. Right. Uh, how'd you end up working with Godhead Silo? Godhead Silo came about, um, I think they were looking for a producer and I think Buzz put my name forward to them. So it was really, it was really that easy. The, 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 one of the, I'm not going to say unsung, but lesser sung heroes of the weird rock world, Mr. Buzz Osborne. Yeah, they were, they were something really special. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, idiosyncratic band have their own voice very very interesting in the fact that they they did a lot with what they had uh but you know kind of a there's a few ways to do that like you know there's there's the band in the room aspect of like yeah they were a powerful live band but how do you go about capturing on that record how did you go about uh the approach for getting that down getting down what god had silo does on a record well, I think on a on a record, you know, I often feel, you know, with rock bands, you don't you don't have that visual element of it, right? And right. you don't have the, you don't have the same intensity of volume that you might have at a concert. So my thing is always like, which is such a big thing with Godhead Silo, they were just this like almost Tycho monolith style presence. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, to me, it's like um, you know, there's 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 that you have to present that, and some of them are artificial. You know, there's some techniques that are artificial to make it see. So so when you play that record on small speakers or headphones, it still sounds thunderous, like you're watching them in a club. You know, and and uh, there's various techniques for that, but usually it's I think, you know, like with Mike's bass, we would we would use multiple layers of amps, you know, so he'd have the big, huge SVT amps. Right. But, you know, that's it's all just bass and muddiness, you know, which is cool. You need that. But then to come across on small speakers, like, okay, let's run through guitar amps and then like successive levels of smaller guitar amps, you know. Right. <laughs> and to, the last one was just like this tiny, fizzy amp that sounded by itself was awful but when you mixed in with on small else. speakers yeah. it would kind of cut through and you know so there's like multiple amps for each frequency section you know that would that would kind of fill that fill that in and I, and I think I made Mike work a lot more on the vocals uh than he probably would have liked to <laughs> which which it seemed with Godhead Silo it always seemed like Mike kind of thought them I don't want to speak for him, but it almost seemed like a bit of an afterthought towards the overall yeah, well, presentation, exactly. you know? Yeah, exactly. And so, you're you know, not going to hear him in the PA anyway, so who cares? <laughs> but, you know, I felt like, you know, the, the vocals need to be a focus because, you know, there isn't any guitar. There is this huge frequency space that's missing. And, you know, and, and I thought that Mike was really good. He, has, he, he you is know, good. He's not actually underrated. Yeah. Well, ideas and, and delivery, you know, uh, I just kind of had to push him to to focus it a bit more. To appreciate, and then yeah, I, I totally had forgotten until you mentioned until you invoked Buzz's name. I wanted to talk about. I mean, I think Stag's like a complete fascinating record, and it, it, it is a bizarre and cool record. I actually almost brought it up earlier when you were talking about splicing takes because I was thinking about uh, the bit and how Dale once told me. I think it was on the show. It might have just been in conversation. Hopefully, it was on the show. Uh, that, that for whatever reason they couldn't, it just wasn't working. Like it, it was, it was just they, the speed was wrong. Like it just was. It was like, oh, it's just ah, it speeds up a little bit there. That just doesn't quite work. Doesn't quite work. And then finally, what they ended up doing is they just did the same thing you were talking about for that Fudge Tunnel song. They just spliced the take of an of an earlier one. They're like, oh yeah, hey, that works. <laughs> that's that's we were playing it right that time. We just played it at the wrong speed the other time, and. <laughs> that's such a common story now, but to have it to be like, Oh no, that was a big record. You know, it was Atlantic records. I mean, big record within the indie rock world, of course, you know, to, to be clear. Yes, and uh, I, they were like super open-minded and I, like, I really loved the way that they were thinking at that, that time. Yeah. You know, one of the songs that I worked with them on, you know, buzz was like, my vision is to do everything wrong. 
everything. So like take everything that you've learned and do the literal opposite, you know? Right. So I was like, okay, so like this mic is really kind of bassy and has a good bass response and you would normally use it on a kick drum, put it on the hi-hat. Yeah. <laughs> what does that sound like? It's yeah. like to me and has no low end, like put that on the kick drum, but face it away from the kick drum. So you're pointing the end that doesn't do anything at the kick drum. How does that sound? <laughs> yeah, it's at you, know, it was, and, you know, and in some cases it sounded awful, but in, in some <laughs> cases it sounded cool because, you, you know, you were, you were reimagining. It's like an impressionistic view of what a rock band is, you know? Which, and especially for that, I mean, for their entire career, but for that record, for as much as, a, you know, as high profile as it was, and they're like, no, we're going to beef art this. We're going to just like whatever sounds cool, you know? And yes, I did change beef art into a verb, and I'm not sorry about that at all. No, I do, I do that too. Beef art can be a verb. So when did At The Driving come to your attention? Um, At The Driving came about... Um, well, I, there was a, a record label based in LA called Alias Records. Uh-huh. They did like... Uh, a couple of knapsack records and oh, Arches of Loaf, who I loved. The amazing Arches um, of Loaf. Yeah. Great band. They did all, all their records. And so I was working for Alias with uh, Trunk Federation, did a couple of records with Trunk Federation and Knapsack. And, um, and Blaze, who manages At the Drive In, was looking for a producer for At the Drive In. Um, and I think back in those days, it was it was maybe a little bit harder to find a producer than it is these days. You know, where there right. there's, there's a lot these days. It's it's a big thing. But back a lot in of fish in the sea days, now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back in those days, it really wasn't. And you you know, there was no internet, right? So you couldn't like Google it. You just had to know someone who knew someone. Knows, yeah, exactly. So um, Blaze was friends with this guy Rick, who worked at Alias. And I think Blaze went to Rick and was like, I'm looking for a producer for this project. Somebody that's good with rock bands. Do you know anyone? And Rick was like, yeah, you got to get Alex. He's awesome. And so, you know, I, they had two records out already that sounded like they were recorded in a sock at the bottom of yeah, the... I think, <laughs> well, I think Acrobat Tenement was like, they made it like $500 or something. It was like one of those, like, yeah, I can tell. <laughs> yeah. And so I was kind of some like, records you 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 made a, you know you, I I don't mean to talk trash but it's like I was like yeah that's fine you know cool demo yeah I, I think everybody would would admit it uh, you but know. then you would see them play and you'd be like oh my god this band is but, insane. well so so here's what happened is that you know I'd heard those earlier records and I was sort of like I'm not sure about this I'm not I'm not convinced about this band particularly those records you know. There wasn't much about them that were that were doing it for me, and so I asked Blaze, "I need to hear something new. I need to hear where they're at now." And he was like, "Okay." And so he gave me a tape, a cassette tape, and what it turned out to be was a boombox in the middle of their practice room. <laughs> that was their, that was their demo. so I put the tape on. It's all blown out. It's distorted. It just sounds awful. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Right. This right. is horrible. And then the vocals came in. And I was like, wait a minute. There's something here. There is something here. So I was like, I I'm hearing some potential, but this recording's terrible i need to see the band and so they were like okay cool we'll we'll have them play a show for you so this was like the in casino out songs at this yeah, point right yeah. like they were kind of they, they kind of moved it which is sort of yeah that that's a very interesting era because i think a lot of people these days kind of know them more from like the relation the relationship of command stuff on but that was sort of like the first like oh yeah these these dudes are cool like this is yeah, interesting was, i think that was the first moment where they you know, in Casino Out and Via were like fundamental for them developing their their sound. Can basically. I tell you a secret? It's the only it's the only ones I ever listened to by them anymore. <laughs> well, Ship of Command still has a 
still has its moments. I still, I still think it's a, it's a great album. So, some good tunes. It's almost painful to listen to because of the, the mastering job. Uh, so that, that's a very specific niche beef yeah. for me. But yeah, anyway, uh, I, I think, I think Vaya and, and, uh, and Casino out are the best recorded representations of that band personally. Uh, so yeah, so you got this incredible singer, this sort of, um, who's got this like MC five energy, but is coming from, a you know, the same sort of place as, you know, like uh, the, the best parts of like Fugazi and Jehu and things along those lines, but has its own thing to it. it has like a Southwest kind of charm, you know, yeah. unique and, and like powerful, like for a young dude, especially powerful so crazy. vocals. You remember earlier on, we were talking about how people just always just want to pigeonhole you. Yeah. It seems crazy now, but back in those days, you know, people would write off at the drive-in left and right. They would just say, oh, it's just a third-rate Fugazi. Oh, it's just a shitty, shitty version of Rage Against the Machine. Right, right. It, like, it seems incredible now, you know, because now you would be in terms of that's a third-rate at the drive-in. I have said or that whatever. many times, actually, because I... I've, I've, I've said that many times. <laughs> but um, back in those days, that was, that was the thing. But yeah. They were just something really, really special. And, you know, they're... Well, El Paso, it's, it's, it's isolated. You know, like you don't have any choice but to like do cool stuff because that's that's why, no that's why you know the best songs like don't come out of L.A. Yeah. and rarely, rarely New York. They come out of places like El Paso or like Tacoma, Washington, or you know, or Birmingham, England. Yep, there's a reason. There's a reason why. It's because because it, if you have too many entertainment <laughs> options, it kind of kind of like sap the creativity. Oh, sorry. I did, didn't realize I was talking over you. I got some latency there for a minute. <laughs> oh, that's, that's all right. You can go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, no, it's just, if there's if there fewer entertainment options, there's less distraction, and you just you have to make your own entertainment, right? And so part of that is well, digging deep. There's less, there's less of the, you know, the, the culture around you that might influence you. So you're, you know, you just literally come up with your own ideas because there there isn't... You don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's probably different these days because any you can be in El Paso, Texas, or Birmingham, or whatever, and you can just go on Google and find out all the influence you want. Yeah. Oh, X-ray specs. What's that? Tap tap tap. Okay, I know everything about that band now. You know. <laughs> so all right. So you you hear this boombox demos and you're like, all right, let's see what these these cats are all about, right? Well, you didn't say that, but <laughs> you want to see them okay. live. Very similar to that. Yes. <laughs> um, What's your takeaway when you when you see them do this stuff? So they, you know, so they said they said, "Look, we don't have any shows booked, but why don't we just come to LA and we'll play a show for you?" Yeah. Why not? We love playing shows. Cool. So it was literally myself, Blaze, the manager, and our mutual friend Laurel Stearns, and the bar staff. Wow. So not so really a private show then. Well, it was open to the public, but just no one so showed up. know them, so why would... It? Yeah, I mean, I mean, not to, again, not to do the thing where I turn it around to be about me, but, like, first time I saw them was in SF at the makeout room, and it was, like, me and, like, six other people. And I was only there because my friend was like, hey, you should see this band from El Paso, which I was like, cool, sounds good. You know, like, like whatever. I don't know anything about this. And then, like, you know... You, Maniacs, right? Yeah, they're leaping off the freaking wall at the makeout room, too, which is like, it's like, wow, this is like the least rock and roll venue ever, and you're making this awesome. Right. right. That's just how they were. They were just were full on, like, in rehearsal. That's how they were. Like, yeah. they didn't, they just didn't care. They were, you know, and they were just so into it. And, you know, that's, that was really fantastic to see because they, they you know, around that time, there was a lot of the, a lot of bands were sort of doing the Weezer thing. And don't get me wrong, I love Weezer, one of my favorite artists. But it was the, like, anti-rock star thing, right? Yeah, you know? a very withdrawn kind of... Yeah, uh, yeah. Kind of like we're not, not really going to show very much emotion here. And, you know, and so for these guys, just, like, bouncing off the walls and just being incredible, um, it was it was fantastic. And they, you know, they, they leapt around uh, Omar... Um, Broke the neck off his guitar on the first song. <laughs> he jumped off the end and he landed. He came down and he landed, caught the headstock of the guitar and just bam, there it was, just broken off. And I was like, just use your spare guitar. And I was like, we don't have spare guitars. Like, that's my- <laughs> and so 
we, <laughs> which is classic <laughs> that band of that era, by the way. I'm just gonna yeah, go and say yeah, that. Like, there wasn't, there's no second guitar. Yeah, there's, there's no, there's no backup plan. Yeah. No, he was able to take the low E string, wrap it around the broken, shattered, like you know, <laughs> screws of the headstock, wrap it around and pull it tight into a knot until it basically was an E. Yeah, yeah, got close enough like, for. Uh... <laughs> Playing single string guitar. <laughs> what a yeah, maniac! Listen. What a maniac! Yeah, so I was like, I was like, guys are incredible. Yeah, but you know, go, like going into that session, it was very low budget, very, very low budget. There was like, I don't even know if I even got paid, or, or if I got paid, it was like next to nothing, like yeah. a few hundred, because you know, most of the money went on the studio, on the tape. There was like eight reels of tape. By the time we're done with the studio and the, the mixing studio and the tape, there's like nothing left. And even then, there was only enough. I think we had three days for recording and one day for mix. So, you know, I was I was like, okay, we're not going to make like a radio ready album. No, you, I mean, you just not, don't have the resources to do it. Right. Yeah, not, not that any of us wanted to wanted to make a radio ready album, but yeah. you, you, we couldn't even do like like a, a good indie rock production. It wasn't even that. It was like all we can do in this time is capture that raw, crazy energy of the band. But also, fortuitously, that's the most important thing for the band right now. Right, right now, it wasn't, it wasn't important for the band to try to be a radio band because they weren't ready for that yet. But what they were ready for was to have that live show represented on a record that, that people could get into. So that was the that was the focus, you know? And so in the studio, I had them play live and just really tried to capture that, that energy vocals and everything, you know, and like jump around and just like, you know, I like turn all the lights off and like, it's like a show. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like something where I was lucky enough that I got to see him around that time, you know, but it's, it's like, that's the only, that era. It's like, Oh, that sounds, yeah, that sounds like pretty close to what that band could do in in a lot of ways. I mean, is it right. is a perfect sound forever? No, absolutely not. But it's it's it gives you like there's a sense of immediacy to it that for a lot of people is what originally drew them to the band. And good on them. They they achieved a higher level of notoriety and success based upon them being them. And they yeah, totally. You know, they they went for it hard. But like that's that's the first one that made me be like, oh, there's something here. Right. And uh, so, but then more so with Via, that was the one that I was like, wow, this is, this is great. And it's something where uh, that was another like relatively quick one too, right? Like it was sort of like there, there still wasn't a lot of time involved with making that EP. Well, half the songs on Via were from the In Casino Out session. Yeah, they were just like, <laughs> you know, just like, I think at one point they were supposed to be just B-sides or whatever, but then it was like, oh, we have these six songs, let's just throw them together and, and make an EP. And they, they, I think they, they came back from tour to do that one, right? Like it was like it was like real, real soon right after. Like they were like coming off of a tour or something. And you know that one, the the songwriting, you can really see the shift. It's a level up, big time. Yeah, from you know from like really cool and but aggressive and energetic rock songs into like actually writing like real epic songs. And they didn't sacrifice any of the energy and vitality to it at all, but they also brought in this element of like it starts to be a little anthemic, you know. I think that's that's used as an insult a lot of times, but I don't mean that as an insult at all. I mean it's it's, it's you listen to it and you're like, huh, all right. And and I do remember all the Rage Against the Machine references, and it's something where I was like, uh, and you know maybe I'm biased because my old band would get Rage Against the Machine references. It's like, if people didn't know Shellac, they would always say Rage Against the Machine. I was like, ah, <laughs> no. But in retrospect, I get it. Uh, because it's like the interplay between the instruments, you know, the, the vocal attack, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the first, for, for me, in, in Casino Out is sort of like the, you know something cool is going to happen with this. And Via is like the calling card for like, oh no, this is something you need to pay attention to right now. Yeah. So did you feel that when you were recording it? Via? Yeah. You know, I only recorded 50% of Via. So I can only 50% answer that. 50% answer it then, yeah. <laughs> but 
but I mean, you knew that this was a special band, right? It's essentially a compilation of of different recordings with some, you know, different producers and different sessions all kind of thrown together quickly, but all from the same time. And, but I, you know, I, I always felt that they had the, that potential, uh, you know, to be that, that amazing anthemic band. So, you know, it didn't, it didn't surprise me and, and it was a, a logical progression with what they were doing. Yeah. So, and, and we, I, we were talking earlier, I was talking about, well, I was talking about the, so it, the gold rush times that led in that early nineties where the weirdos were let in. Right. And when, it is fascinating now that those dudes got close, you know, they, they got, they got, they got right, they got right up there and they did it without really sacrificing any part of what made them who they are. And I think that's something that the hot take industrial complex makes it really easy to shit talk things that maybe uh, you're not a hundred percent on board with, especially in the internet, but it's kind of something where their moment there with that, with that, the drive-in and it was weird. It was weird and cool to see that play out. Uh, and how is that? How is that coming from the fact that you know you maintained a relationship with those dudes, even though what's well, Ross Robinson that did the uh, relationship of Command record? Is that right? They, they told me that they made the record not so much with Ross, but in spite of Ross. <laughs> so there you go. But it should be it should be noted that. Um, you know, like, yeah, they, they almost had their moment. And the reason that it's an almost is entirely their own fault. They, they broke up at literally right before they were, they were going to be very successful. Yeah. And that's, and that's where, again, you mentioned earlier, you know, so like, no, no, you know, so many bands can claim like, Oh, we almost had our moment and it just didn't work, you know, right. Because of, or because of, our A and R guy fucked it up, or whatever. This reason, like, that reason. It's like no, these guys. All, like it was like there. It was right yeah, there. Yeah, they, they fucked it up. Yeah. All they had to do was hold the angle, and not so much. Right. As it turns out, yeah. They, but the, the, again, yeah, the hiatus instead of breaking up and then <laughs> retroactively. Well, Newport said. I mean, you know, on a, <laughs> on a human level, or you know, for them as like being friends of mine, like I totally felt for them because like I. Like I mentioned, I was never a big fan of touring. And sometimes, you know, the pressures of touring would get to me and I would feel like mentally like not in a good spot, you know, sometimes. Right. They were doing it way more than I was ever touring and way yeah, longer. They were road dogs. They were killing it, yeah. especially yeah. then. And so, you know, I think like uh, mentally, you know, I can, I can really, I, I really feel for them and what they were going through and it was a, a lot of pressure so you know i don't i don't i'm not surprised at, at what happened you know like i said i sort of begged them to consider it as more of a rest than a than an right. actual stop full stop but i i guess it was really too late which which is sort of i think that's the same advice that buzz gave to isis instead of <laughs> instead of them breaking up was just like just take a break guys <laughs> yeah. uh and it's I think that's more. Hmm. I think that's more understood and acceptable now. But it definitely, it wasn't done really. Oh, back in those days, it was. Yeah, hundred percent. There was no. There was no like reunion circuit. There was no reunion industrial back. complex. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. If you said that, if you said that you were broken up, that was it. Like you were yeah. done. Yeah, maybe you'll get a tribute album at some point, but it, it's over, Johnny. Right. <laughs> so then, when when you end up moving to San Francisco, at that point, I'm sorry, say again. When do you end up in San Francisco, or when do you end up in the Bay Area? I should say. I I lived in the Bay Area from um, 99 until um, 2004. So in fact, uh, during during some of the time I was working with at the drive-in and also some of the time I was working with Mars Volta was I was in, uh, in the Bay area. 
And when do you start playing with uh, Chess and Dave? Like when when is when do you start getting together with Theory of Ruin? When does that come was, together? That was probably around like 2000, 2001. And I think I felt like, you know, I'd I'd had that thing is so you know so by this time, it's probably been like six years since Fudge Tunnel stopped, and you know I was kind of feeling like oh wouldn't it, it'd be really nice to be able to do a band again and play some shows and you know, <laughs> um, I you know for me personally I kind of feel like being you know being in a band is sort of like going camping you know, <laughs> it's like if you, if you haven't done it for a while it seems really appealing and it seems like you're know, especially touring you know? <laughs> but then once but you're once doing it it's uh you're like yeah, oh, yeah. You there's it. all these bugs like, what the fuck yeah <laughs> like with this there's no real toilet and there's bugs everywhere and i just want to go home you know um i i loved playing with the river and i love playing with those guys um and you know we did a fair amount of touring but it, it was very difficult it, it was also difficult physically because i was older you know like it's so sleeping harder. yeah tell me about it. Harder on, the, on the body um but still you know i mean we did it but then you know there there also came a point for me when i had a realization that i could either be in a band or i could work in studios and be a producer and i could be good really good at either one of those. But you couldn't necessarily do both of them at the level. Nope. Yeah. I, f- I felt like to do both of them would be, would be compromising either one of them. You know, to, to do a band, if you're going to do a band, or, or if you're going to be a producer, like <laughs> you have to do it 100%, 110%. You have yeah. to dedicate to doing it and doing it all the time. And, and really, you shouldn't even be taking any kind of hiatus. That's a last resort for sure. You know, you really need to be doing it full on to, to really do anything worthwhile. And so I would sort of decided at that point, like, okay, I'm already like in my 30s. And, it's not you know, going to get easier I, on your body as time goes on. <laughs> no. And, you know, the, the producing side of it, has an income to it. It might not be, uh, it might not be a million dollars a year, but it's certainly going to be better than playing in a noise rock band. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, playing in a noise rock band means you're losing money. You know. Well, I mean, we did one of the tours that we did lost. You know, lost multiple thousands of dollars. And you know, like I've never, I've never cared about money and music. I don't. You know the never really been interested in that side of it but also who wants to lose thousands of dollars yeah, it's, they're, they're, I'm, I'm, fine, I'm fine with breaking even and i'm fine with making no money you know right but i'm not fine with like constantly losing thousands of dollars it's, but, it's untenable bob weston from shellac uh coined the term i i'm gonna give him credit for it even if he got it from somebody else uh it being greens fees you know, people like when you golf, there's like your greens fees. It's like, if, as long as you're just paying greens fees, then like, you know, you're doing okay. But yeah. if it gets to the point where you're like, you're, <laughs> you're losing mo- enough money to like, buy a car, then there's a problem. <laughs> and of and course, Chillax know, doing fine. Don't get me wrong, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's like, I was totally fine with doing that for you. I mean, we lost so much money with Fudge Tom. We never made any money yeah. with Fudge Tom. Who cares? I wasn't doing it for the money. I was doing it for the love of it, and it was fun. But yes, eventually you reach a point when you go like, doing it for the love of it is not quite enough, and not. Yeah. And I'm not even breaking even. I'm just literally losing money. And it's tough, and it's a shame because uh, I think Theory of Ruin was a massively underrated band. Uh, you know, it was it was you know I already knew Chess's drum playing. Uh, but to see him like play in, you know, for lack of a better term, a rock band was sort of like, oh, awesome! Like it reminds it's in the same way that like James Lowe playing in Chavez was of like, oh yeah, I, I know you're gonna nail this against the wall. It's like, oh yeah, that's oh that's yeah. awesome. And you know, you I guys, feel like I was really lucky because you know, Chess, Chess was or or is basically a jazz drummer. You know, totally, it's not his his vibe. Jazz drummer, yeah. he just happens he just happens to love John Bonham. You know, 
But I think at that point, Chess had, had like almost given up on playing rock music, you know? And so I was like, Chess, let's play rock music, you know? It'd be really awesome. And so, you know, I think, you know, we were one of the last people to play with him to be doing that like really bombastic rock, you know? And I, I feel honored at that. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it was a hell of a band. I, I mean, I don't, it's like I said, it's, it's the one I can pull out of the back pocket for people and they're like, Oh wow, this is great. It's like, yeah, man, I know. <laughs> that's why I'm, that's why I'm bringing it up to you. And I think the tunes hold up and it's uh, I think theory of ruin was, I, I think if it had been a little earlier or a little bit later, <laughs> I think theory of ruin might've been like very successful, but yeah, totally. I know. You know, there's a lot of bands you can say that about, I guess, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's true. So then, yeah, let's talk about let's talk about non-noise, rocky kind of stuff, right? Like, so it, when, when you're being when you're being a producer, you're being an engineer. The idea is you want to get the articulate the vision. You want to get the best part of the sound out of the person. And it's going to be a different approach from like a Godhead silo and a death cap for cutie, but it's the same, <laughs> it's the same mindset. Uh, has there, has there been any kind of bizarre cross pollination moments of, of things while working on these, you know, I hesitate to use the term pop records, but like pop records where you've learned something just like really weird from recording like you know a punk rock band or recording like you know a you know something like deeply like bizarrely indie rock or something where you're able to like ah this is something that i can apply to this situation and and be of value what ha- what are some specific if you can think of any examples of applying that and being able to kind of cross pollinate those worlds from a record standpoint mm-hmm. Right. Well, I think that's a good question. <clears throat> and I, you know, I think what I've learned about myself over the, over the years, I mean, I've always been a, a song person and I think it surprises people when I say that, but even Fudge Tunnel. It's a song. It's, it's, an, always, it's a noisy band, but it's a first song band. Chorus, yeah. First chorus, first chorus. Yeah, Every yeah. single song. Um, it may be delivered in this incredibly <laughs> obnoxious and aggressive way, but it, it's song structure. So, you know, I'm all, I've always been about songs. Um, but I have very little interest in songs that are, that are delivered in a very straight pop fashion. You know, to me, there has to be something edgy or weird about it. There has to be, you know, some smear to the, to the portrait that, that makes it work for me, you know? So like, you know, when I was growing up, (laughs) yeah, my two favorite bands when I was growing up were the Beatles and Black Sabbath, you know, and I think if anything, that's probably what I was trying to do with Fudge Tunnel. I just, I just couldn't write songs like Lennon McCartney, you know, and in, in, of course, the, the first time I heard Weezer, I was like, oh my God. Yeah. That's that's what I was trying to do. (laughs) Yeah. And they did it. And it's amazing. Um, so for me, you know, I like I've carried that that concept through is the it's the idea of the contrast, you know, like I love noisy stuff. And, you know, and when I, I go see bands doing cool, expressive stuff, it like it always appeals to me. But if there isn't a song behind it, I'll get bored really quick. Right. And, you know, and that's like when I was in Brooklyn, that's what I would see all the time. You know, it'd be like these bands with all these pedals, like awesome sounds, you know, like really cool vibe and like they look awesome. But then, you know, they played the second song and I'd be like, you just played that one. And then the third one, I'd be like, it's the same one again. It's, it's oh, a, a sound band. It's instead of a, a Yeah. It's, it's not a song band. It's a sound band. And I, that's, um, I think yeah. that's a very important distinction. Yeah. And then sometimes I go see bands who are very song orientated and that's literally all they have. And there's not much of an edge to it or there's nothing particularly like exciting or creative about it. Um, you know, so, so to me, that's where the magic works is it's that, it's that contrast between having a great song and an emotive song that speaks to people. And then it's delivered in a creative way that like i said that has like the smudges of dirt on it that 
that give it that, that ground it in reality to me or you know or, or make it feel like it's coming from much more of a creative place not this super glossy <laughs> articulated uh pseudo perfect vision that's completely inauthentic but have some kind of uh have some dirt rub some dirt on it <laughs> right you know so that that's what i saw in at the drive-in that's what i you know the first time i heard okay computer i was like you know just mind blown because that's that's exactly what they're doing so to me you know it's i you know i'm trying to find with artists always that that perfect balance between is the song there and does it communicate a feeling to the listener and then how can we temper that or accentuate that with cool sounds and weird uh weird smears that that you know that work to com- to complete the picture for me right so if you so if you're in a situation where you're you know working on like you know a block party song let's say like is there something where you can you can hear something in there that like, Oh, that's cool. But that's too, I don't know why I picked on them specifically by the way, but, uh, but it's like, Oh, that's a little bit too on the nose. Like what if we, you know, threw in this kind of like weird curveball with it? Like what would well, happen there? Block Party, Block Party are a great band. It's, yeah. It's a pretty good reference. Um, yeah, you know, I, it, it varies every time. And, it, you know, sometimes it's just a, Sometimes it's just a chord thing or a voicing thing. So like, hey, this song's just feeling too happy, too major. Like, let's let's throw in a minor. Right. Let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's let's throw a thirteenth under here to give it a little bit more tension to it, or you know, whatever it is, or um, you know, or or do we do like a like a silver apples kind of thing where like. We're gonna we're gonna keep the chord structure the same, but we're just gonna have this really weird, dark sounding synth yeah. that works with it. And I mean, for somebody like uh, Block Party or maybe even Death Cab, you know, like I think Death Cab are pre- pretty good at doing that, where it's like this is a, a pop song and it's very poppy, but we're gonna layer it with these like we echoed out guitars or this, this weird dark synth that that take a little bit more colorful place. Yeah, I'm not sure, and this is, this might sound <laughs> a long time listening to the show because I've never articulated this. It may sound weird, but I don't think they get enough credit for that kind of stuff. Like it's it's. I think that there's a way that they could do it that would be far more straightforward and potentially even more successful. But it's better to have that. It makes it interesting to me, anyway, uh, to have that 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 kind of weird element to it, and to have that kind of like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> It's almost psychedelic or something. Yeah. And I think inadvertently, because it's not, it's not their intention, but it's like that gains them a wider audience because, right. you know, once you go full on pop, like, yeah, that's cool. You, you go to the, the pop world, but then you've written out an entire section of your audience that, you know, are not going to listen to anything that's not, if it's too uncool, you know? Yeah, and that, and that's the uh, that's that's the one sort of corollary that's held over from the quote unquote sellout argument era of indie rock mm-hmm. is that like people will still abandon you like a like a sinking ship if they feel that you that you've you're going for the gold a little bit too hard, and that's mm-hmm. still bizarre to me. But I, I think it's interesting. I think it shows through with all your work. I want to make sure that uh, before we go, I, I don't want to give short shrift. We mentioned it like really really early on but you know i was uh i was listening to some more recent alex newport and i've heard it before but i i I tend to listen to everything when i'm about to have someone on just so i can be refreshed with it really really kind of struck me how interesting the stuff is and it's when i say new it's new in the case of band like five years of red love i'm talking about by the way uh you've been doing this band like what like five years or something now at this point right like it's been a little while um very different, but very cool, very dense, very, very, um, very layered. How did that come to pass? Has uh, many analogies to the, the nail bomb situation where it was literally Matt and myself, you know, two Brits both hanging out in New York. And Matt had, Matt had just left Block Party. Right. So I think he was like, 
he was a bit discombobulated, didn't quite know what to do, you know, had gone from like all that rigorous touring schedule and didn't quite know what to do with himself. And, you know, we were hanging out. You know, Matt, when I was working with Block Party, I love all of those guys, but Matt in particular, it struck me that his his musical taste was very, very similar to... with what you were, yeah. We both love uh, what's now called kraut rock very, very much. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> what, is, what is now, uh, for better or worse, called kraut rock. And so we kind of, you know, so we kind of bonded over our, our motoric obsession. And, you know, and so... I think Matt really felt like he wanted to be doing some music and, and I also had that desire to be doing it, but I didn't want to fall back into the, the touring band the thing. Putting out the record, going through the yeah. cycle, yeah. doing the thing. Yeah. So, you know, so we were kind of like, let's just do this, like really low key, no expectations, just have fun with it. And um, amazing fun, like so much fun working with, Matt and I think at some point you know we we talked about like let's bring in other people only there's only the two of us there's only so much you can do but before long I think we realized it was that was actually the strength of it was the fact that it was the two of us and there's a lot of space that's uh yeah yeah. so hard on like where it needed to go that bringing other people in would have just complicated it would have just diluted it you know um so it really just became about the the two of us Um, so that, you know, that record, we made no attempt to tour on it. And as a result, not a lot of people know about that record. And, you know, I think we're okay with that. We're okay with it being discovered on a, on an organic level, you know? Um, but it, you know, it could have found a wider audience, but I think the fact of, of the matter is both of us are, are just too busy to be able to really do it. Well, I mean, but, you know, by the time the record was finished, Matt was already had joined Algiers and was already touring yeah. with Algiers. You know, busy dudes doing doing a lot of stuff. It's yeah. hard, it's hard yeah. to <laughs> it's hard to find the time to do much of anything, let alone to uh, to to bring it to the people as a live show or right. something, right? Exactly. Well, I was you know I was just glad that we were able to even just find the time to to put that record together, and and uh, it was it was so much so much fun. Yeah, it's cool. I I like it, and it's it's not, it's maybe not what people would expect, uh, but that's kind of what I like about it. So I guess I'm the target audience. Is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and also, you don't need to know about any of that, any of you guys' other bands to appreciate it. Like it works on its own. Like it it has a, yeah. Yeah. It, it has a feel and sound all its own. Uh, Alex, I want to thank you so much for doing the show. It's it's been great talking to you again. It's yeah. Been, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for, for it, having me. It's been entirely too long. I can't believe it's actually been this long. Um, so that that's on me. We could have done this years ago, and I just, I don't know. I didn't even have Crover on until like a month ago. So, I mean, what, what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I just forget about stuff. Sorry. It's a, it's I, a, I, completely, I completely understand, and uh, it's, it's not a big deal. It's been really awesome chatting to you. Uh, last thing, and something that I always ask folks when they come onto this show – and you can answer it any way you like, but why do you do what you do? I, I <laughs> sometimes I ask myself the, the same. The same. <laughs> you know, mu- music can be the music world can be incredibly frustrating, and you know, and some, you know, anybody who plays music or records music or is involved in music in in any way at some point will ask themselves, "Why the hell am I doing this?" You know, it's incredibly difficult. There's no money in it. And it's, it's a lot of work, you know. Um, and I'm sure so many people know exactly what I'm talking about. But what will happen with me is that, like, once a year, twice a year, maybe, I'll either I'll work with somebody that is so incredible or, like, somebody like Matt where, like, we have that instant connection. Or, um, or in the case of recently, I made a, a record with an artist, Matt Costa, and we just hit it off in such an incredible way i feel like that's why i do this but it it's it isn't always at that level sometimes it's just going to see some show and that like i don't even know who's playing there's you know some of my friends bands are playing and i i'll just see an amazing p 
people are having a good time and and I think okay that's that's why I'm doing it because you know music really speaks to people in a way beyond any other sort of art I think and this is not to downplay other arts because I'm a I'm a huge fan of all the the arts and visual arts too but there's something about music that's like just that instant visceral connection that is that is something really wonderful you know well I think that's wonderful and Alex, thanks so much, man. Really appreciate you. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you, my man. <laughs> Take care and you stay too. safe. All right, you too. You too. Wear a mask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wear that mask, assholes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There he goes, Mr. Alex Newport. Let's hear uh hear your hear a uh let's hear a theory of ruin song to play us out. Play us out! go party people there we go can you hear me now this is a theory of ruin sleep at the wheel uh that's off countercultural nosebleed that's like the 
That's Alex Newbert band that most people don't know, but as I say that, that's true, but not necessarily 100% true. Uh, you know. Good band, though. Check them out. Uh, if you like Fudge Tunnel, if you like the weirdo noise rock stuff, you know, let's get to it. Uh, Red Love, too. Red Love is a band with Alex Newport. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. You can find their stuff on all the normal places that you find stuff <laughs> on the internet, where we all live. I want to give you a shout out for uh, Mr. Alex Newport for coming on the show. Uh, I love that dude, and a lot of respect and uh, a lot of respect for that guy. And real guy to take the time to do it. Anyone within the sound of my voice? He's on all the social media. Go find him, Alex Newport. I think he's the, the, there's an AlexNewport.com to Instagram. Twitter, all that, all that stuff, all the things you think that a dude like that would be on. Uh, hey, name of the show is Code of Neutron's Protonic Reversal. This show airs on Radio Nope. Say yes to Nope. Microphone turns sound into electricity. Thursdays, eight Eastern, seven Central, six Mountain, five Pacific. Can you hear me now? RadioNeutron.com for the archives. Out on Route 128, in the dark and low. Thanks for listening. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the, it's the end of radio. The last announcer plays the last record. The last what? Leaves the transmitter. Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now?
really broadcasting if there's no one there to receive? It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. Thank you.